Okay, is everybody happy? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, we are in the process of opening the doors, turning off the music in the bar. How many people are here for the show one more time? Okay, there's only two that aren't. Now what I need, and they're welcome, um, what I need is for a show of hands, if you have, along these benches, if you have room for someone to sit by you. You have room over there for seating? Uh, Nancy, be, you, before we, you sit down here, let's get, we got people who can, can bring in, we got, we got two there, can sit along the wall. We can take one here, that's three. How many more? We got three in the back over there. So we got about six people that can come in and sit down. <coughs> and then, Ter uh, Terry, would you set up those folding chairs along there? Right in the middle of the floor, <laughs> close to that door. And then there's two more outside the door that had ice on them that we're going to have to tighten up. Who's waiting for a chicken quesadilla? <laughs> he tells me not to do that. <laughs> I know. They are good. Okay, Nancy, I'm going to... Uh, do we have all the... Si Who's got space? I got space for one here. I got one over here. That's two. Terry, guide them this way. Got one over there and one over here. Leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think that's about it. Okay, my next question is, Nancy, can they hear this in the bar? Can you hear us in the bar? Otherwise, they come in and stand right there for now. All right, so a couple of ground rules. Once you're in your seat, you can't move. You have to stay. <laughs> no, seriously, um, we're going to try to keep it real quiet. Everybody's here for the show, right? So you'll be quiet. All right, in one minute, I'm going to start the event. Come back before then, I'll bet. <laughs> After I go to Chadron, Chadron, <laughs> Chadron. Chadron. Okay, the standing room people got to just stand. We, someone needs a seat really bad. Um, there's one more seat right outside the door, I think. There's a seat right here. Over, Colleen, over here. Okay, let's hear a pin drop. Everybody really quiet. We got the one person that's going to mosey over to that seat. All right, we're going to start. Welcome to the Heartland Cafe. How many have been here before? All right, I love it. Okay, I'm Michael James, and along with my partner, my business partner, Katie Hogan, we welcome you to the Heartland. And we are so excited to have this event happening tonight. Uh, we were honored to have, well, first of all, let me say, we're going to turn left off the interstate. We're going to take a step into America. We're going to hear some reading and some stories that is really about what most of this, us in this room are about. And uh, we all have our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations. We're uh, looking forward to a better future. And uh, through good literature, particularly nonfiction, I think that we can get some uh, guidelines in that direction. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet at the cash register 
that would be a great thing for you to sign because you may not know there are other great events that happen here too. And that way you would get a wonderful little newsletter and you can always take yourself off the list. So, um, we're just going to do it. Molly, come on up. and You're taking over for me. This is my new friend Molly. Yeah. All right. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, we're excited to have you join us. Just a quick note to turn off any cell phones or noise making devices so that we can keep it as quiet as possible. And that after the reading, we have a few books for sale in the general store, and they're at a discount, so you should check them out. In describing the sun, Bill McKibben said that the sun is the most real of magazines, a monthly reminder that everyone has a story to tell and a voice to tell it in. We have four of those voices here tonight. Krista Bremer, Poe Ballantyne, Cheryl Strayed, and Cy Safransky. Our first, yes. Our first voice this evening is Krista Bremer. Krista is the recipient of a Rona Jaffe Writer Award, a Pushcart Prize, and a North Carolina Arts Fellowship. Her essays have appeared in the Times of London, O Magazine, and others. She's the associate publisher of The Sun and a regular contributor to National Public Radio. Her forthcoming memoir will be published by Algonquin. Krista. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to read to you tonight an excerpt of an essay that was published in The Sun called You Are Not Pretty. And it's an essay that uh, takes place over several different ages of mine. And so um, I'll just jump right in. Age 15. We're eating in the cavernous dining room at the country club with my grandparents and their friends. Silverware gleams on white tablecloths next to pink cloth napkins folded into fans. Elderly couples shuffle slowly past, their walkers squeaking, and dark-skinned waiters serve my big sister and me ginger ale in wine glasses, which we sip from while listening to my grandmother's neighbor, Lyle, tell a funny story in a loud, dramatic voice. My grandmother's conversation is like the cool air humming from the air conditioner. It makes everyone comfortable while drawing as little attention to her as possible. But Lyle's conversational style reminds me of a wrestling match. She catches people by surprise and throws them off balance, making listeners laugh even when her words smart with truth, but always backing off before the pain becomes too much. Though Lyle is as old as my grandparents, her face is lit with mischief, and when she throws her head back and laughs, the sound that comes out is like the shriek of an exotic bird. She's one of my grandmother's oldest friends. My grandfather was once her husband's boss, a distinction that is very important to my grandmother, but whose significance seems to be lost on Lyle. Her shock of platinum blonde hair bothers my grandmother, who, on the drive home from the club, shakes her head and mutters to no one in particular, poor Lyle, doesn't she know you can't be a blonde forever? I know from the way my grandmother talks about Lyle that her behavior is inappropriate, but I can't get enough of her. I love the way she asks me how I am, as if she really wants to know. I love the way she elbows me, as if we have secrets. Most of all, I love the potential for surprise that she carries everywhere with her, like a bouquet of wildflowers, a tangle of whimsy and unruly color. With Lyle in the house, the conversation doesn't just purr along like my grandfather's big American car. It gains sudden momentum, takes sharp turns, makes me sit up and pay attention. She parts the heavy curtain on the grown-up world and invites me to peek inside. Age 18. 
When Lyle's husband dies unexpectedly in a traffic accident, my grandparents wonder if she will move away, perhaps to be closer to her daughters. But she stays in her house, using part of the insurance money to buy herself a sports car. <laughs> On a visit to my grandparents' home, I see the car crouched in her driveway like a wild thing, threatening the nervous conformity of her neighborhood. I decide to stop by and say hello. Lyle swings her door wide and invites me into her home, which seems twice as big and darker in the corners without the presence of her husband. She asks me about college, and I tell her I've been assigned the second sex by Simone de Beauvoir, which I've been staying up late to read, underlining sentences and scribbling thick exclamation points beside passages. <laughs> She tells me about a bus trip that she recently took to Las Vegas, how a widower with an offbeat sense of humor sat so close to her that she felt the heat of his thigh against hers. And then she asked me about my love life. I'm still dating my first love from high school, the boy with whom I discovered sex, studying it with more single-minded focus and dedication than any of the extracurricular activities I listed on my college applications. Each weekend night of my senior year, he picked me up in, my, in his parents' station wagon, and we went in search of dark, uninhabited places, empty parking lots, the clearings behind water towers, service roads that led to high fences and abandoned fields. We folded down the back seat, unrolled a sleeping bag, and spent hours conducting elaborate experiments on each other's bodies. Afterward, we lay breathless and entwined, our knees and backsides burning from the rough upholstery. My boyfriend had good grades and brought me to church with his family, and my parents liked him. <laughs> because he talked easily to my mom and willingly ran errands with my dad. He had tight black curls, coffee-colored skin, slippery white teeth, and streaks of acne like war paint on both cheeks. I always undress clumsily, my head hitting the car roof and my jeans catching around my ankles, but all my shame and self-doubt burned away in the heat of his desire. He told me over and over again how beautiful I was, whispering the words like a prayer. But I could bathe in his adoring gaze for only so long, before, as in a hot bath, the temperature cooled and I needed to stretch my legs. One night in the station wagon, he propped himself up on his arm and said, do you know what I want to do? I had been imagining what it would be like to have sex in one of the cool streams in the valley where if you sat perfectly still, you could feel the lips of tiny fish nibbling your thighs. I want to be a dentist, he said. <laughs> I stared up at the car's low vinyl ceiling, trying to picture this, his long slender fingers in latex gloves, holding a drill to someone's open mouth. Now we're at different colleges. In our conversations, while I feed quarters into the payphone in the dorm hallway, he's begun to talk about marriage. I love him with careless abandon, like a screen door swung wide on broken hinges, inviting in the bugs as well as the breeze, erasing the boundary between inside and outside. But I do not understand how that kind of love leads to marriage. Instead, it whets my appetite for more experience. If a shy, lanky boy like him can make my body hum with electricity, then what about all those awkward college boys? The one who works beside me in the cafeteria, his cheap polyester uniform stained with sweat, the one who takes such frantic notes in class that I know the top of his head better than his face. The one who stood hesitantly at the edge of a bonfire at the beach, his chin tucked into the collar of his jacket. All my doubts came tumbling out of me in Lyle's living room. And when I'm done talking, I wait anxiously for her to speak, feeling ashamed of what I've revealed. 
She does not offer advice, as I was expecting. Instead, she begins to talk about a wedding she recently attended. She describes the bridesmaids' dresses, which match the centerpieces on the banquet tables, and the boutonnieres in the groomsmen's lapels, and the bride herself, wrapped in billowing layers of white, like a lavish present. The decorations were all so pretty, and the bride was the prettiest of all, Lyle says wistfully, and then her gaze settles on me, and she wags her finger knowingly. But you, you're different. She hesitates for a moment, as if unsure whether to continue, and then declares, as if it were a statement of fact that left no room for argument, you are not a pretty girl. I cannot believe what I've just heard. Though I've harbored the same thought for some time, I haven't dared verbalize it. You just aren't, she says, smiling and shrugging her bony shoulders as if to say, so what? These words would have seemed cruel coming from someone else, but she spoke them in such a carefree and even encouraging way that I'm not hurt, just speechless. In the dim light that filters through her heavy curtains, Lyle sits with her shoulders curled inward, her cheeks sagging like empty pouches. But beneath her curls, her eyes shine with love and admiration. She's not pretty either, but there is something irresistible about her. On the drive back to the dorm, I think more about her comment. Pretty. Even the word sounds delicate, the tongue fluttering against the roof of the mouth like a trapped butterfly when it's spoken. Alone in my room, I take a look at myself in the mirror. I could almost be pretty. I'm tall and long-limbed with blonde hair and blue eyes, but I'm not. My hair is one problem. Straight and limp, never blown dry or styled with products whose fruity stench burns my nose, and I have too much body hair, soft and blonde, coarse and brown, <laughs> and wiry, invading all the places women are supposed to be smooth and hairless. And then there's my face. Even when I paint them with color, my lips are too thin, and my strong jaw lip makes me look determined, not helpless, like the models in magazines with their pillowy lips and longing looks. My breasts are compact and hidden beneath the loose clothes I wear, far too small to offer up in fleshy mounds. Even with the help of the padded push-up bra I recently purchased and that now stands at attention where I dropped it on the floor. <laughs> Though my legs are long and toned, my knees splay out in two different directions each time I sit down, making it dangerous for me to wear miniskirts. I think of the prettiest women in my dorm, the ones with perfect figures and flawless skin who eat plain popcorn for dinner and spend hours in the bathroom artfully applying makeup and styling their locks. When I try to look like them, I feel like an over-eager child in an ill-fitting Halloween costume, going door to door, my hand outstretched for something sweet, approval from parents, desire from men, admiration or envy from women. But like candy, these rewards dissolve too quickly and I'm left craving more. Plus, the costume makes it difficult for me to move and beneath the brittle mask, I find it hard to breathe. The beauty I'm drawn to is unmasked, sometimes unsettling, usually fleeting and unexpected. Lyle's face in the late afternoon light was naked with loneliness and humor, wisdom and fatigue. That, I realize, is what makes her beautiful to me. Age 25. I'm home from graduate school for a brief visit with my grandmother before leaving for Delhi, India, where I've landed a summer internship in the office of an Indian company. My grandfather has been dead for several years, and my grandmother is confined to a nursing facility off an eight-lane freeway. When I arrive, I find her curled into a ball, 
covered by a thin sheet. Her hair, usually so carefully done, stands up in angry gray tufts, and I barely recognize her without her bright lipstick. I'm frightened to see this woman I love in this sterile place, where the sound of traffic blends with the whir and beep of the machines that are keeping her alive. I'd looked forward to this visit, but my grandmother's vacant gaze makes me feel like a stranger. I sit by her bedside and speak to her, but she turns toward the wall as if she wants to sleep. I stand up and pace the shining linoleum floor of her room, which is hermetically sealed from the outdoors by thick glass windows that don't open. There is no human commotion, no clutter of busy life, no smells of cooking, not even any plants. Some frame family pictures on the nightstand are the only artifacts of her long life. I pick up a picture of my grandmother and hold it close to my face. She must be around 40 in the black and white photo, but compared to the woman in the bed, she looks like a child. Her sleeves are rolled up and she's bent over to work in the garden. Her hips are shapely in her work pants and her head is turned as if the photographer has caught her by surprise and she is laughing at the camera. You were so beautiful, I say softly. I thought my grandmother was asleep, but now she makes a sound of disgust at the back of her throat. Ugh, I was fat, she says. Less than two weeks later, I step out of the Delhi airport into a heat that makes me queasy, wrings the sweat from my pores, and melts my thoughts into a disoriented blur. Pollution, thick and black, stings my nose and throat, and the dizzying throng of humanity pouring through the city streets gives me vertigo. Delhi's three-pronged assault of temperature, crowds, and filth nearly brings me to my knees each time I go outside, and yet, over and over, I stumble upon beauty. A young boy at a produce stand flashes me a smile through a cloud of flies, startling me with his perfect white teeth. In a dirt alley, I pass a white cow with black eyes who steps gingerly around puddles of putrid water like an elegant white-haired lady in her Sunday best. In the aisle of a crowded bus that reeks of sweat and exhaust, the gold thread